Good afternoon. I am Harry Poston, Director of the American Statistical Association's Project for the Filming of Distinguished Statisticians. It is my privilege today to welcome you to the 11th Pfizer Colloquium of the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut. We are fortunate to have the continuing support of Pfizer Central Research for this program because it allows us to bring to our university the most distinguished scientists in the field of statistics. It has also allowed us to videotape most of these colloquia for the archives of the American Statistical Association. Because of the importance of today's talk, we are again videotaping it for ASA's archives, and I'll call upon my colleague, Uwe Kern, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Harry. Eric Lehman, Professor Emeritus of Statistics of the University of California at Berkeley, has been a leading researcher and teacher of statistics since he received his doctorate from Berkeley in 1946. As he describes in his conversation with Morris de Groot that appeared in Statistical Science, May 1986, he had a triple of PhD advisors. Sue, who posed the problem, uh, Polya supervised, and Naaman, who returned in time for the final exam. That was quite a triumvirate. <laughs> Eric Lehman's pioneering work into the principles of statistical inference is deep and insightful. Due to time constraints, I can only mention some of it. His paper on families of admissible tests published in 1947 is seminal. The concept has been used and developed by a myriad of mathematical statisticians. His joint work with Sheffe, which appeared in the Sankia papers, Completeness, Similar Regions, and Unbiased Estimation, Parts 1 and 2, is among the fundamental works in statistics. The nonparametrics research is held especially dear here at Connecticut, where Godfrey Noether was department head for many years. The efficiency of some nonparametric <coughs> competitors to the t-test, written with Hodges, has been used to sell non-parametrics to me methods to statistical users and consultees ever since its publication. The paper, The Power of Rank Tests, is particularly nice. Now it gives understanding of the alternative structure for rank tests and also presents an important technical device, the Lehman Alternatives, for the study of such tests. I particularly enjoy the paper in interpretation of completeness and Vasu's theorem because of its use of mathematics to illuminate statistics. Professor Lehman's clarity of thought and exposition have made him an excellent teacher. A generation of PhD statisticians were raised on his 1959 book, Testing Statistical Hypotheses, and on Colin Blythe's 1950 notes of his course, The Theory of Point Estimation. The former, which has been translated into Russian, Polish, Japanese, appeared in a second edition in 1986, and the latter appeared as a book in 1983. Professor Lehman's outstanding research into the mathematical aspects and structure of hypothesis testing, estimation, decision theory, and nonparametrics has brought him much honor. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow three times. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, to the National Academy of Sciences, he is an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, and he has received honorary degrees from the University of Leiden and the University of Chicago. His fellow statisticians have elected him president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Given his eminent research in the field and his lucid and insightful exposition of his own work and that of others, <coughs> we're fortunate to have Professor Lehman to speak to us today about two centuries of hypothesis testing. Professor Lehman. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Kuhn. <clears throat> as, as I was sitting here, 
I was reminded uh, that two years ago I uh, was in the audience when an opera was being recorded and the conductor before the performance started uh, admonished us that we should be very quiet so as not to disturb the tapes but he said when there are jokes you can laugh so <laughs> I uh, would like to extend this invitation to you too <clears throat> I should like to thank very much Professor Poston and his committee for inviting me to speak this afternoon and particularly also for suggesting the topic of this talk namely that talk on the history of hypothesis testing at first I was rather enthusiastic when I received that suggestion, and I tried to resist it. But anybody who knows Harry Poston could have told me that such resistance would be futile. And indeed, eventually I gave in. And then when I started working on it, uh, I became rather fascinated with the subject, namely by realizing how from extremely modest beginnings hypothesis testing developed to become one of the most widely used and some people say misused uh, techniques of scientific methodology and it's this development that I'd like to sketch for you this afternoon testing became a separate subject with its own concepts and its own terminology only in the 1920s and 1930s. But substantial use was made of testing throughout the 19th century. And so one may ask, what is the difference in the approaches of this earlier period and the later one? And this difference can be characterized very nicely by something once said by Joe Bergson, who was for many years the chief statistician of the Mayo Clinic, and who said in a related but not quite identical context there was a time when we didn't talk about hypothesis testing we simply did it so what did these earlier people do without talking about it short answer is they carried out tests to specific scientific problems without much ado about it. They, they just went ahead and uh, calculated things. <clears throat> Isolated instances of such applications occurred in astronomy and demography in the 18th century, as far back as 1710, by, for example, Arbuthnot, Daniel Bernoulli, the French naturalist Buffon, the scientist John Michel, and by far the most important toward the end of the 18th century by Laplace. <clears throat> Laplace codified his approach at the beginning of the 19th century in his great work, Theorie Analytique des Probabilités. The tests that occur at various places throughout this book are based on de Moivre's normal approximation to the binomial and on Laplace's own central limit theorem. The plus primarily dealt with four problems. The one two sample binomial problem and the one two sample problem of means. And I should like to illustrate one of these to get a little bit more specific on the one sample problem of means which we'll show in the first slide. Um, the assumption is that you're dealing with a sample x1 up to xn of IID random variables with an unknown distribution f which has mean mu and variance sigma squared which is assumed to be finite. Then Laplace knew that root n x bar minus mu x bar is of course the sample mean divided by sigma tended in distribution to the standard normal distribution. That was just exactly the statement of the central limit theorem. He also knew that sigma root squared which is sum of xi minus x bar squared divided, it doesn't matter whether you divide by n or n minus 1 since we're doing asymptotics, converged in probability to sigma squared. In modern terminology, it was a consistent estimator of sigma squared. And finally, he realized that if you replace sigma by sigma roof in that first limit statement, it remains valid so that t equal to root n x bar minus mu divided by sigma roof still tends 
for the standard normal distribution, and you can use that result to test the hypothesis mu equal to mu zero just exactly the way you would do it today. Laplace's tests took two forms. In modern terminology, the first is to calculate the p-value of the observed value of t, and if that was too small, you considered the result significant. The second one, which is supposed to appear on slide two, uh, calculates approximate confidence intervals for mu, and this goes just the way we do it today. Uh, we know from the first results that the probability that root n x bar minus mu in absolute values divided by sigma roof is less than any constant c, and so we can adjust the constant c so that this has a given probability. And then we can invert this first statement uh, and notice that it's equivalent to mu lying in the interval from x bar minus c sigma roof over root n to x bar plus c sigma roof over n. Now, since these two statements are equivalent, they have the same probability, and uh, so you know the probability of statement two, and then you uh, reject the hypothesis mu equal to mu zero if the interval does not cover the hypothetical value mu zero. Now, the confidence intervals obtained by Laplace were not only by this first method of inversion of one leading to two, but also he used a Bayesian argument. Namely, he obtained these same intervals, at least up to this order of magnitude, uh, as posterior intervals assuming a prior uniform for mu. And much discussion occurred in the 19th century and reaching into the present century of which of these two derivations is better, or perhaps I would rather say which of them is less bad. Now, Everybody knows what the criticism against the Bayesian uh, derivation is. The criticism was made already at that uh, early in the 19th century. Namely, it is that uh, uh, where, where does this sudden assumption of a uniform prior come from that, that really isn't justified. But what possibly could be wrong with the first derivation? That looks perfectly straightforward, and uh, yet Throughout the 19th century, people puzzled about it tremendously. And I read and read and tried to understand what bothered them. And I finally realized that it was a question of interpretation. These writers all thought that the confidence intervals, the intervals two, were interpreted once the x's had been observed. And so x bar at that point and sigma roof were constants. Well you still have a probability statement, so mu must have, by some miracle, have become a random variable. And the, what puzzled them is whether it was still justified to say that the second probability statement, with its totally new interpretation, had the same probability as the first interpretation. Now, this really was not uh, straightened out very well until this century with, with the uh, named theory of confidence intervals, and Laplace himself was not much help in this matter. He published these two different derivations about 100 pages apart in his book and never compared the two. So uh, nobody knows how Laplace himself thought about particularly the uh, first, first of these uh, derivations. Well, throughout the 19th century, except this rather futile discussion that I've just mentioned, very little progress was made in hypothesis testing, except for enormous broadening of applications in astronomy, in demography, in medicine, criminal justice, psychology, and possibly other fields. The only really important development in this theory occurred at the very end of century with a paper published by Carl Pearson in 1900, uh, the famous paper where he developed the chi-square test of goodness of fit and for independence and contingency tables. This was based on uh, the multivariate normal approximation to the multinomial, and so again was a large sample approach. 
And throughout the 19th century, the common feature of all of this work is that it was approximate large sample work. Change in direction came from a very unexpected source. William Seeley Gossett was a chemist who worked for Guinness Breweries and did statistical work for them. And in this work, he found that he had to deal with very small samples, samples of four and five, that order of magnitude. <coughs> and he realized that the uh, normal approximation just wouldn't work for this. But he also came to the realization that if he could assume the shape of the distribution f that we had in the very first slide, if that were known, then you could determine exactly as a small sample result the probability of these uh, tests and confidence intervals. And he worked out the distribution of the quantity t for the case that was f is normal and obtained for it what is today known as student's t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. He published this in 1908 under a pseudonym. And the story for the pseudonym is kind of interesting. It is that Guinness was so proud of the fact that they were using statistics in their work and found it so useful that they didn't want the competitors to catch on with that. And uh, they were afraid that if one of their employees published under his own name, then this would become known. So they insisted that whoever published statistical work uh, among their employers uh, had to do it under a pseudonym. And one, for example, published as Sophister. Uh, Gossett was an extraordinarily modest man, also a very, very nice man, and he published under the pseudonym Student, uh, and he's much better known under that name today than he is under his own name. Student attached very little importance to his own, to, to this uh, discovery of his, and didn't think anybody except himself would ever use it. But it was taken up by R.A. Fisher in a series of papers from 1915 to 1925. At the beginning of that period, Fisher was just 25 years old. In these papers, he gave a rigorous proof of student's results. Student was not a mathematician, and his derivation had big gaps in the proof. He extended it from the one to the two sample problem, to regression, to correlation, and to the analysis of variance. And all this work culminated in a book, which was published in 1925, uh, under the title Statistical Methods for Research Workers. And this, together with Laplace's book, they're both displayed on the slide, together with their dates, uh, I believe the two most influential and significant books that have ever been published in statistics. As you notice, if you look at the dates, the books are just about 100 years apart. They had one common feature that most readers of both of them complained that they were extraordinarily hard to read. Fisher's work on testing during these 10 years and in the book are a remarkable achievement. But very surprisingly, he did not push it as far as he pushed his theory of estimation, which he published during the same period. There, he developed a general theory. Here, he followed the example of Laplace and his predecessors and only presented tests in connection with specific examples. In particular, he developed no criterion for quality of a test and no indication of how to choose one test rather than another. <coughs> These problems were taken up by Naaman Pearson in a series of papers published between 1928 and 1933, in which they developed a theory with three principal accomplishments. First, they introduced the concept of power. Secondly, they suggested that the best test would be the one that maximized power. And finally, they developed a general framework for hypothesis testing, rather than only considering specific examples. Each of these three uh, concepts led to important developments, which I want to outline very briefly. First of all, power is, of course, an enormously important concept because it is the chance of detecting an effect when it actually exists. And quite a number of investigations have been carried out which show uh, 
that many, many scientific studies uh, published that have such low power that they have really no chance of detecting the effect that they're after, even if it does exist, in which case there isn't really very much use in publishing them in the first place. In addition, power, of course, enables one to determine the sample size that is needed to get a reasonable chance of uh, detecting the effects you're after. And uh, this whole matter was exposited in a, a very nice book by Cohn in 1969, in which he developed additional concepts, uh, presented all the necessary tables, and uh, presented a coherent presentation for social scientists particularly. Optimality theory, the original named Pearson prescription of choosing the test that maximizes the power works only if the same power maximizes the test against all alternatives, which typically isn't the case. If that isn't so, then additional concepts are needed, such as unbiasedness, invariance, stringency. And this program was worked out during the next decades and was summarized in my book on hypothesis testing. Finally, a general framework that they developed was based by Neyman and Pearson on the idea that statistics is a guide to behavior, in particular in connection test, that behavior would consist of either rejecting the hypothesis or provisionally accepting it and taking whatever consequences this implied. And this idea, uh, a little later, led to Wald's general decision theory, which was published in 1950 as the test of decision functions. These three books are on the slide. Uh, as you notice, of the three, the only one that didn't have a second edition is Walls, because unfortunately he died uh, at the end of the year of 1950 in an airplane crash. These developments raise an interesting question. Laplace's approach had been in place for 100 years without leading to a general formulation. Then small sample theory was developed uh, by Fisher and Student and practically immediately was followed by the development of a general framework, a general development, which led to really an explosive development of the whole subject. And the question is, was that an accident that this, that this general development had to wait for the small sample theory, or is there a reason for it? When you think about it, it's fairly clear that the, it's not a coincidence. The reason is that large sample theory was tied to the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem applies only to means and functions of means. So the choice of test statistic had to be a mean it was dictated by the tyranny of mathematics that was available. Well, small sample theory, any test statistic was usable, any region constituted a possible rejection region, and therefore was a potential candidate. And so only at this point, A, was it possible to really formulate a general theory, and B, did the question of choice of test really arise in any serious way. Curiously, Fisher did not accept any of the new ideas of Neyman, Pearson, and Wald. To the end of his life, he died in 1962, he fought the idea of power, he didn't accept the need for a theory of choice of test, he claimed it was obvious what test to use in any particular situation, and he ridiculed Wald's general decision theory. Nevertheless, by the mid-1950s, these ideas were fairly generally accepted. There was fairly complete small sample theory was in place by that time. And so we now have the 19th century large sample theory, the more modern small sample theory, and we may think that this is the end and we can all go home. <laughs> but as you know, the hour isn't over, so there must be more to come. And the reason, of course, is that in science, whenever one problem is solved, it raises a lot of new questions, and this occurred here too. I'd like to talk about two of the developments that arose out of the development of small sample theory. <coughs> the first goes back to the name th Pearson theory, which I presented in a slightly oversimplified version. They did not immediately in 1928 
come to the formulation of maximizing power as the desirable way of formulating a test, but instead proposed likelihood ratio tests as a reasonable uh, general approach. Likelihood ratio, it's on the slide, is the ratio of the maximum of the probability of the observed value under the model divided by the maximum under the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is rejected when this ratio L is sufficiently large, that's to say, when the observation X is sufficiently more likely under some alternative than it is under the hypothesis. Now, given any specific problem, you can, of course, exactly calculate C from the model, but typically that is a rather difficult and messy calculation. And it is very nice that there's a very general, elegant, large sample solution, which was offered by Wilkes in 1938. Namely, if the x's are a sample, if they're iid, then minus 2 log l has approximately a chi-square distribution with r degrees of freedom, where r is the number of parameters specified by the hypothesis. Likelihood ratio tests are probably the, the most widely used kind of tests. If today somebody runs into a new and moderately complicated testing problem, the first test they probably will calculate is the likelihood ratio test, which has such an easy way of calculating its uh, critical value. Now, the second new development that I want to talk about relates to a fundamental difference between the old large sample approach and the new small sample one. In the large sample theory, calculations were, of course, approximate because they were based on the normal approximation, central limit theorem. But no assumption was needed about the shape of the underlying distribution f because the central limit theorem doesn't require any assumption about f. It holds for means from any f. Now, the situation is just the op opposite with small sample tests. They are exact, assuming the model, but they depend possibly very heavily on the model. And the model, of course, is always only known approximately. And so the test is again an approximate one, but for very different reason. And the question that arises at this point and that already student formulated and was worried about is how sensitive is the test to the model assumption. This is the subject of robustness, and uh, I'd like to illustrate it on the one sample problem. So on the next slide, we again go back to our old setup where x1 up to xn are iid according to a distribution f with mean mu and variance sigma squared, which is finite, and we want to test mu is equal to mu zero. We believe that f is normal, and so we apply the t-test at level alpha. But in fact, f is, of course, not normal. It never is. And so the true level of the test will depend both on the sample size n and on the true distribution f, denoted it here by alpha n of f. And the question is, how good an approximation is alpha n of f to alpha, or are they at all close? And the first result is that alpha n of f tends to alpha for every f as n tends to affinity. And this is Laplace's result, which we had in the very first slide. But then the question is, how large does n have to be for this approximation to be good? And there the answer is less happy. How large n has to be depends on f. There's no guaranteed n that will work for all f. In fact, Bahadur and Savage showed in 1956 that for any given n, the soup of alpha n of f over f, that's to say the maximum level as x varies, is equal to 1. So you think you have 0.01 or 0.05, but if you pick the right f, in fact, you have arbitrarily close to 1, uh, which is not very satisfactory. You can summarize this perhaps by saying that the t-test is robust, but it's not reliably so. The situation is much worse if you want to test the hypothesis about the variance, sigma equal to sigma zero, because there the first limit result also doesn't hold. The alpha n of f no longer depends on al uh, uh, 
no longer tends to alpha. It can tend to just about anything it wants to. Uh, the test is extremely sensitive. That's the chi-squared test. The same thing is true for the F test for ratio of variances. They're extremely sensitive to the assumption of normality. And it's my belief that they should never be used in practice, although they still appear in textbooks. The concern with model depends that I've just described uh, led not only to a study of robustness, but also to a search for tests which would be free of this model dependence, which would be distribution free. An important such class was discovered in the so-called rank tests, and it read, led to an entirely alternative uh, methodology of statistical testing, namely non prometric testing. And as an example, on the next slide, we have the two sample test, we now have a sample x1 up to xm from one distribution f and another sample y1 up to yn from distribution g and we want to test that these two distributions which are otherwise completely unknown are equal. The alternative are the one-sided alternatives say that the y's tend to be larger than the x's and to test h we rank all m plus n observations we denote by r1 up to rm the ranks of the x's by s1 up to sn the ranks of the y's and then uh, Wilcoxon in 1945 proposed a test which carries his name which rejects when the sum of the y ranks the sum of the s's is sufficiently large um, now the first reaction to uh, the proposal of such tests was, well, maybe it is necessary to uh, resort to such extreme measures, but it's sure a shame. What a waste of good observations. Well, actually, Wolfowitz once pointed out, it's a waste of information we don't have. Uh, so the question is, how much information is really lost if we use the Wilcoxon test when, say, the t-test is appropriate because we really have normal observations? To answer this, Pittman in 1948 introduced the concept, which is outlined in the next slide, of asymptotic relative efficiency, ARE, of one test to another, as the ratio of the sample sizes required by the two tests to get the same power against the same alternative when the tests are carried out at the same significance level. And Pittman computed this for the efficiency of Wilcoxon to T in the normal case and found a very surprising result. The asymptotic real efficiency was 0.95, 3 over pi. So you lose less than one observation in 20. Uh, if you want to use the t-test with 20 observations, you do just as well if you use the Wilcoxon test instead with 21 observations. So this uh, loss of information that was so feared actually doesn't take place. Now you may ask, what happens if the two distributions, since we don't really believe it's normal, if it's not normal? What happens to the efficiency then? Well, the slide shows two other uh, numbers. In the case, the distribution F is logistic. The ARE is 1.1. So the Wilcoxon test is slightly more efficient than the t-test. In the case of double exponential, it's 1.5. So the Wilcoxon is substantially more efficient. And you can get efficiencies of Wilcoxon to T all the way up to infinity, for example, when F is Cauchy, then the efficiency is infinite. Now, it was stated earlier that I've written a book on non-parametrics, so maybe I'm very partial to non-parametrics, and so I've picked out all the examples where the Wilcoxon test does well and the t-test does poorly, uh, and the question arises, how low can the efficiency get? The lowest I've given you so far was 0.95, and Professor Hodges and I showed in 1956 that in fact the efficiency can never drop any lower than 0.864. So the maximum efficiency loss that you can sustain by using Wilcoxon over T in the setup is a little bit less than 15%. So the upshot of this whole comparison and this applies to other rank tests too, very similar numbers, is that little is lost by using the normal uh, the, the non-parametric test in the normal case. A lot may be gained in non-normal cases and never 
very much can ever be lost. And so these uh, calculations, and Professor Kern pointed that out, uh, led to uh, the popularity of non-parametric methods and uh, the big change in methodology. Now I should give one warning. We say that the Wilcoxon test is distribution free. That doesn't mean that it's assumption free. The Wilcoxon test still assumes that you're dealing with independent observation and of course in practice the assumption of independence is very risky, very often not satisfied. If the observations are dependent, then neither the t-test nor the Wilcoxon test is very robust. Non-parametrics as a new methodology and uh, pretty well understood was in place by, say, the early 1960s. And so uh, we can distinguish at this point three phases. First, the 19th century large sample phase, then the small sample phase of student Fisher, Nim, and Pearson, and thirdly, the robustness studies and introduction of non-parametric tests. In describing these three phases, I have emphasized concepts, and so I've omitted a lot of other things that really should have been said, but for which there isn't time, namely particularly development of tests for an ever-expanding classes of problems, of models, multivariate analysis, for example, count contingency tables, goodness of fit tests, sequential analysis, and so on. I also restricted attention to first-order asymptotics and neglected refinements obtained from higher asymptotics, for example, asymptotic expansion such as Edgeworth, and also other kinds of approximations, for example, large deviation theory. Now returning again to the three phases that I've described, we can ask the same question that we did once before at the end of the second phase, are we now finished? And the same answer, of course, arises that uh, new problems come up from whatever has been achieved, new questions get asked. And one source of these new questions at this point is that by that time, the mid-60s, uh, the use of tests had become enormously widespread. In particular, many journals required for publication uh, the inclusion of a test, preferably which rejected the hypothesis at the 1% level. Uh, and there was a backlash against this excessive use of tests and led to a lot of criticisms. And I want to mention two aspects of this criticism. One, there should be another slide on that, is that often more than one question is asked of the same data, or which is essentially equivalent hypotheses or even models are suggested by the data rather than given a priori as assumed by the Neyman Pearson theory. This is the uh, much feared, I should guess I should say, problem of multiplicity. It's a very difficult problem to alleviate it. Theories have been developed of simultaneous inference, of multiple comparisons, of model selection, and this is a very important ongoing uh, area of research. The other criticism arises from the fact that Reporting of an outcome of a study is just acceptance or rejection of a test at a prescribed level is a very uninformative way of summarizing results of a study. <clears throat> Instead, it is now often recommended that one should report either confidence intervals or p-values. Now, if you listen carefully, you may be struck by the fact that this is exactly, these were the two ways in which tests were carried out in the 19th century. So uh, perhaps this very strict adherence to name Pearson theory was sort of an aberration and uh, we're returning to a better way of treating such problems. Well, I characterized first three phases. Can I characterize uh, the work that came out of these various criticisms that I've just outlined as a fourth phase. It's a little risky because we're still in the middle of it, and I don't know that I'm a good prophet, but 
my feeling is that it's the, perhaps what ties together these various researches that I've described in this fourth phase is consideration of families of hypotheses and of testing problems instead of just looking at a single problem. Now these modifications to meet criticisms constitute one direction in which the subject of hypothesis testing and changing. There's another which caused by an outside influence rather than from internal development, and that's the advent of high-speed computing. And I'd like to mention just three ways in which high-speed computing clearly has an important impact on methods, on, on hypothesis testing, and this should be on the next slide. The first is that computer-intensive methods have become possible that were not feasible before. And examples are randomization tests, which one really couldn't carry out in the past very well, or tests based on resampling methods, such as, for example, the bootstrap. The second way in which uh, computing has an important impact is that it is now possible to analyze large data sets. And by that, I mean sets of 10,000s or hundreds of thousands of observations where throughout most of my career we were thinking of samples of 10 or 20 or maybe 100 observations. And it's clear that this will require very, very different methodologies. And uh, we're just uh, in, in the middle again of this development. And the third aspect about which I really can't say anything, because also it's not that far along, is that many routine analyses are now being performed via statistical packages. And it's clear that the packages and the way they are put together and what they recommend will have a very important influence on how testing is carried out, and we'll have to see how that goes. Now, I started this talk by saying that one of the most widely used techniques of scientific methodology was testing. And I'd like to just briefly indicate how hypothesis testing fits into the process of science. This is a subject which is discussed a lot by philosophers of science, but mainly in a deterministic rather than a stochastic setting. The classical description, which is sometimes modified in a variety of ways, is the so-called hypothetical deductive method. It distinguishes two stages of scientific investigation. First, some observation is made. Uh, you notice something that is puzzling, that requires explanation. You think about it, you worry about it, you ask yourself what various existing scientific theories have to say about it, and you eventually form a hypothesis. And then you perform an experiment to test this hypothesis, and you either reject or provisionally accept the hypothesis. There are statistical versions of this program, particularly most of you are familiar with Tukey's division of statistics into exploratory and confirmatory data analysis, which corresponds pretty closely to this division by philosophers of science. According to all of these versions, the testing is crucial in the second stage, but plays essentially no role in the first. I think that is a misconception. I think often even in the first stage, a lot of informal testing, preliminary testing, goes on to suggest what are the most promising directions and which ones should be abandoned. The other thing that needs to be said is that this two-stage description that i just given is an oversimplification, and everybody who works in these things realizes that. Uh, both philosophers of science and statisticians such as Box and Tukey have written about it. Scientific investigations rarely consist of a single experiment, but are usually an ongoing process in which experiments performed suggest something, then you investigate this, and it goes on like this, alternating between the two stages that I've mentioned. And then you must look at the whole of it, not just at one step at a time. And uh, beginnings of this are being now made in uh, meta-analysis which teaches one how to combine the results from several different studies, uh, from several different experiments, into overall tests or confidence intervals. Well, I've sketched the growth of hypothesis testing 
from the modest beginnings in the 18th and 19th centuries to a highly influential, widely used methodology. And it's interesting to ask whether one can see any patterns in this 200 or 250 year development in this history. And it seems to me it's driven by two rather obvious forces. One is a desire to adapt the methods to ever widening range of applications, both in subject matter and in terms of new goals. The other is the continuing need to bring the theory closer to the way tests are actually performed in very complicated actual situations. These efforts show no signs of abating. One direction in which I expect things perhaps to change in the future is that testing will be considered less as a separate subject and more closely integrated into more comprehensive statistical strategies. On the other hand, it seems to me that despite all criticism it has received, and some of it is very severe, testing seems to meet, meet a need that users just don't, can't be talked out of. So I don't think we're at the end of history yet. I suspect that uh, maybe there'll be a phase five, and then a phase six, and it'll go on like that, and it'll be very interesting to see what they look like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lehman, for an illuminating discussion and coverage of the history of hypothesis testing. I feel that I was fortunate in being able to encourage you to consider the topic. This concludes the 11th Pfizer Colloquium. <laughs>